good morning. Uh, I'm going to assume that if you are watching this particular video that you have possibly watched my others. So uh, I'm going to stop introducing myself. If you're looking at this, you see my name. Uh, but I did want to one more time uh, give a shout out to my buddy Dave Bradley, the, the gentleman who created that music that you just played. Uh, we're just going to jump in this morning and continue with our walk through the kingdom path, which is what we're calling this, which is a walk through the Beatitudes found in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to follow the same format that I've used in the other videos. Uh, as I said earlier, this is a companion, an extension of a written blog that I keep. Um, and forgive me for being really, really low tech, but this is how we're going to do this. If you're curious about reading this blog, there you go. It's, it's rolemodeling.wordpress.com. You can go there and click on it and read back. I've been posting things there for just about 10 years, maybe? Seven years. I can't remember. Seven or 10. I think I addressed it in one of the other videos. Uh, and in fact, as you hear me go through these uh, various uh, Beatitudes, you'll notice that a lot of it is coming straight from the, the written blog there. Uh, I, I will paraphrase and reference that. In fact, I've got it printed out right here in front of me. Uh, this is my post uh, on Matthew chapter 5, which is those who mourn. And we'll just jump right into it. Uh, like I said, we're going to read from some different translations and ver versions, paraphrases, and then jump right into discussing uh, what this particular passage means. So this is Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. I'll be reading from the CSB, the ESV, the NLT, the Amplified, and then the Message. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That's the Christian standard. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The ESV, big shake up there, will become shall. Then the New Living Translation, which remember, they, they try to give you the definition within the actual text instead of being quite so literal. It says, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. But even there, it's still pretty much the same. And then remember, the Amplified in brackets within the text gives you uh, the different ways to read and understand it. So blessed, and then in brackets, forgiven, uh, refreshed by God's grace, are those who mourn, and in brackets, over their sins and repent. So that they're taking the interpretation a little step further. For they will be comforted, bracket, when the burden of sin is lifted. There's a lot of interpretation going on in there, and that's the Amplified Bible. And then Eugene Peterson in his, his paraphrase the message says, you're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. Uh, as, as I've mentioned before, uh, the NIV, uh, the NAS, the KGV, they're pretty much identical to the CSB and the ESV, so I'm not gonna repeat them. Uh, I do like the little subtle difference there in the New Living uh, because, like I said, they try to explain what the word blessed or blessed. Uh, I never know, is it blessed or is it blessed? I hear it both ways. But they try to actually explain uh, and give you, give you the interpretation. And then the Amplified goes even further. Uh, one that I haven't been including that I took a look at is the Holman Christian Standard. Uh, but after looking at that, I think I want to share that one uh, to give you a little information on the Holman Christian Standard. It's the predecessor to the Christian Standard, which is the one I just started with. The uh, CSB is a, a, a new revision or update to the Holman Christian Standard. Uh, and one of the reasons I've been using the Christian Standard is because I got it for free. Uh, they were doing a promotion on Facebook. It says if you are a pastor, if you are a minister, if you'd like a free copy to tr tr try it out, contact us and I got a free one uh, and it, it, it's it's brand new it's only been around uh, I'm not sure exactly how long the CSB has been around the Holman Christian Standard has only been around since 2004 so it's only about 13 years old and if I'm not mistaken the CSB was actually released earlier this year so it's a brand new revision uh, and if you go to my blog there in this particular post on those who mourn, there is a link there talking about the CSB and how that happened. Uh, I naturally assumed that because the CSB is a revision 
uh, to the, the Holman Christian standard that it would be pretty much identical, but it's not. Uh, the CSB, remember, says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And in the Holman Christian standard, the predecessor actually renders this verse like this. The poor in spirit are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, the difference is subtle, but it is different. It's a lot different than what you would expect from a simple revision. Uh, and with the exception of the message and the amplified, which are really different uh, approaches to translations and paraphrasings, almost all of them have the exact same sentiment. Uh, uh, I've mentioned that I'm really starting to like the Amplified the more I look at it, uh, especially for the purposes of studying. Uh, it's not one I want to read out loud. Uh, it's not one that I'm going to read every single day, but when I'm, I'm looking at verses and I'm doing some studying, I'm probably going to consult it in the future because I really, really like it. It's very useful when comparing versions. Uh, I know what I get when I look at the message. I know it's going to be hit or miss. Uh, I appreciate the work and time Peterson's put in it. Uh, and as I've said before, he's not just throwing this stuff out there. Uh, he studied the languages, and he's doing an honest attempt to put it in a contemporary type language. But but I know sometimes the message is going to go in places uh, that are just odd to me. One thing I never really addressed in, in the other videos and the other posts on this blog is what is actually meant by this word bless or blessed. Once again, I'm not exactly 100% sure how we're supposed to pronounce that. Uh, I'm not consistent at all. Sometimes I say blessed and sometimes I say blessed. I'll, I'll begin by saying I am not a biblical language scholar. Uh, I, I never formally studied Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic or any of those things. Uh, I did take a class on how to use biblical language tools and that's what I rely on is the tools and the commentaries and those that understand and know the language and study it. Uh, so the information I share here is coming from other sources. Uh, it's coming from, from lexicons and things like that. Uh, and because I, I don't necessarily know this language and I haven't studied it, if I pronounce a Greek or Hebrew word incorrectly, uh, it's simply out of my ignorance. It's not intentional. Uh, I'm not trying to set a new precedent. And if you're watching this and you would like to correct me, by all means, please correct me. So forgive any mispronunciations of these words. Uh, but the word being translated blessed or blessed here is the Greek word makarios. And it occurs 26 times in the New Testament. It's most commonly translated happy or blessed. There is another Greek word that's translated happiness, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but I do have it on the blog if you want to look at it. But that one is not used in the Bible at all. It's not used in the New Testament. But even though we use the word happy and blessed in English, this, this idea of this word, makarios, it moves beyond being merely happy. It's not about just being happy because you woke up and it's a great day and you're happy. Uh, the idea is that those who are blessed, they're fortunate, uh, they're better off because of God's favor, and it also moves beyond the idea that, that uh, material wealth or possessions here are the things that make you happy, so there's a spiritual aspect to it that moves beyond just being happy in the physical material sense. And this statement here in Matthew chapter 5 verse 4, blessed, blessed, are those who mourn for they shall be comforted it says that those who mourn are in this state of being blessed uh, the state of being uh, in God's favor uh, forgiven refreshed we sometimes use this verse in funerals or in situations where people have lost loved ones and, and God does bless those who have suffered loss. This deals more with a mourning of mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning of a spiritual nature. Uh, it's true that this word can express the mourning of death over someone. However, I believe in the context here, it's building. Once again, this is a progression. This is a pathway that you travel down beginning with being poor in spirit. So if the starting point is recognizing your spiritual bankruptcy, and then we're moving along, 
then the idea of this morning is tied in with this spiritual awareness. Uh, it's the idea of being spiritually poor and recognizing the need for a Savior. And then once you realize that, you realize just how lost you are, just how much you need Jesus, that should break you. That should cause you to mourn your personal sins because those are the things that put Jesus on the cross. When you realize that you and I are the reason he died, it should break our hearts and it should cause us to truly mourn the fact that we are sinful and we're separated from God. And that should make us long for this reconcil reconciliation with God that's only found through the blood of Jesus Christ. When you reach this point on this journey, that's the moment that repentance starts. And re repentance is not just feeling sorry for your sins. Repentance is making a deliberate, conscious decision to turn away from past behaviors and past thoughts and past attitudes. It's, the, it's at that moment that we begin to grieve over our own sinfulness and the eternal consequences it cost us and what it cost Jesus that should move us forward along this path. It's a visible grief. It shouldn't just be this bad feeling you have inside. Oh, I don't feel good today. Oh, I sinned. I feel bad. This should be visible. People should be able to see it. It should express itself in the things we say and the things we do. It's a visible grief that it's difficult, but not impossible to console. Have you ever seen someone so broken up over something that you just couldn't console them, you couldn't comfort them at all? That's what our sin should do to us on a spiritual level. When we realize just how sinful we are and what it cost Jesus, it should just leave us inconsolable with the exception of Jesus stepping in and saying, I've taken care of this. James, the half-brother of Jesus, puts it this way in his book. In James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, he says, Therefore, submit to God. And that's what this pathway is about, is about submitting to God, submitting to the kingdom values. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. He will lift you up. When, we, when we're confronted with the fact that God is holy and we're not, it should break our hearts. It should terrify us the way it terrified Isaiah, but it should break our hearts because Jesus died for me. He died for Lee. As I mentioned in the previous post, the Beatitudes are this series of progressive steps that one takes to become a true disciple or true follower of Christ, a true citizen of the kingdom. Admitting the need for Christ is the first step, and that conviction should lead to repentance, which is tied up in this second step. When that happens, Jesus says the person who has confessed their sins, who has repented, will be comforted comforted. Uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this Greek word, parakaleo. The same root word there. Comforted suggests the idea of having a legal advocate, which is how Jesus describes the Holy Spirit in John 14, 16. He says the Spirit is called the comforter or the advocate. When we're convicted of our, of our sins and it breaks us, these first couple of steps, Jesus has promised that his spirit will step in and comfort us and let us know that he died for us, that we are forgiven. Being a Christian or a disciple or a follower, a citizen of the kingdom, is more than just saying we believe what the Bible says about him. Jesus began his earthly ministry by setting ground rules. In order to truly follow him, the first thing you have to do is to confront a holy and mighty God and recognize that you're not worthy to stand before Him. None of us are. That realization should break us and cause us to be truly shaken by our own sinfulness and cause us to mourn and grieve that we put Jesus on the cross. And once that happens, God will step in and He'll lead us the rest of the way. So that's our, that's our step here today is... Blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. Recognizing that we're sinful, Jesus died for us. That should break our hearts. 
And that should cause us to repent, to turn away. And then Jesus says he'll step in and he'll comfort us and he'll forgive us. May God our Father give you grace and peace. Uh, bless you today. Uh, once again, check out the actual written blog if you would like to read more. Uh, leave comments. Let me know. Is this helping? Uh, are there other things that uh, I could address? Leave a comment. Let me know you're watching. Uh, and we'll close once again with my brother Dave Bradley down in North Carolina.